So, yes, my name is Jill Hartke, and I am the digital archivist here at the Albuquerque Museum. I run the photo archives department, which is shares a wall with the auditorium. And so um, at the end of this program, if you are interested in seeing what the photo archives looks like, we do have a public research room that you're totally welcome to come into during our, our uh, open hours. Um, I'm here Monday through Friday, so that's when the photo archives is open, um, usually 9 o'clock to about 4 p.m. Um, and then there is a collection storage vault attached to that research room where most of the photo archive collection is held. There's a little bit that's held downstairs in the vault with, uh, the, with other parts of the collection. But if you're interested in just seeing it, if you're curious, um, I'm, I'm happy to share that with you. So uh, I have created a visual podcast series called Picture This, and that's really what I'm going to speak to you about today. And my hope is that um, you'll maybe be inspired to create your own visual podcast, because I think it, it can be a little bit intimidating to think that um, you can produce you know, a storytelling series, an online series, but it's not, I'll show you, it's, it's not that uh, difficult. And I know all of you, since you're interested in history, you have stories to tell. And the photo archive is a public collection. So please use it to, to help tell the stories that you want to tell, that you want to share. Okay, so uh, just to give a quick overview, and I'm going to kind of go through this pretty quickly since I hope to share, uh, to show the collection to you later. But the Albuquerque Museum Photo Archives is actually probably over 150,000 items um, in the collection right now, mostly prints and negatives, also panoramas. Um, also, we have uh, radio programs, we have silent film footage, we have uh, footage that does have sound. Um, we have scrapbooks, photo albums. This is uh, what the prints and the negatives, this is how we store them. They're just stored in filing cabinets, um, but sleeved properly. Um, these are archival, archival safe storage uh, sleeves. Um, next. This gives a little bit of an example of how the storage room looks. Um, these are our film canisters that are, that are stored on, on an open shelf. We do have flat files. That's where many of our um, framed photos, but also our tin types, our daguerreotypes, and our ambrotypes are stored flat in those files. And then we have color slides. Color slides are stored in freezers to try to slow the deterioration of that old color film. Okay. So uh, I'm the digital archivist, um, and that, that is a new term, a new title that was uh, attached to the job in 2018 when I accepted the position. And the reason why we added digitized is because the digital part of the collection is really how you um, help provide wide ranging access to the collection. And so for me, digital archivist, it, it really helps emphasize that access portion of my job. So the, the, we, we work to digitize, to digitize this collection to preserve it because scanning does capture the, the image at a particular moment in time, as it continues to deteriorate, we, we will have this one version that we can hold on to uh, when it was perhaps in better shape. Um, we also digitize to make the collection accessible, as I said. The collection is public. Uh, people are welcome into the photo archives to see this, to see what we have. You can use it in your projects in whatever, whatever you want. I think that having the collection be only in that room is not useful to anyone. Like it need, they need to have lives outside of this building and you are the reason that, that I'm here to sort of facilitate that. Um, and the collection, it, as I said, it's, it's most useful when it's out in the world. So that's what I'm trying to do. That's what I view as sort of the mission of my job here uh, to, to protect, but also to provide access. So we do have an online uh, version of the Albuquerque Museum collection, and it's it's called E Museum. And um, it's I'm sorry that it went the link went behind there, but it's it's albuquerque.emuseum.com, and I can 
can share that with you later if you want to hear it again. But we've got over 10,000 items from the photo archives that are online. We're trying to add to that. The, the art and the history department also, some of their collection has been digitized and it's put online. So you can go here. This is sort of the landing page that you wind up on. Um, you can use this up here to search. I will warn you, this is not Google. <laughs> so this does not bring up, it's not intuitive. Um, the advanced search option here is probably a better way to actually try to pinpoint something. If you're looking for something really specific, I would suggest doing the advanced search option and then searching in like description field or something like that. That that would be a better a better way. But if you just want to browse, there's so much stuff to see on that on that online site. And you can download the images, very low res JPEGs. But if you want to use those, feel free. We have all the information on the record. So you have the credit line, you have the date, you have if we know who the artist, the photographer is. It's all it's all in those records. Oh, and here, here's an example. Uh, so this is uh, an example of two items from the photo archives that are online. And so you see the information that's available on the record. Um, you have to click on, when you, when you open the, the website, this little mark here is actually, um, it's hidden. So you have to click on the, on the little uh, icon next to the description page or the description word, and then it'll drop the description down so that you can actually read what you're what you're looking at. This is what a lot of the photos, um, the photo archive collection looks like. But down there, I wanted to show that to you because some of our radio programs are available online. And so because there's no image, it looks a little bit awkward. But on the bottom, you'll see the little speaker icon. When you click on that, it'll load the program and you can actually listen to the radio programs. They're really cool. They're from the 1970s. There's amazing topics that are in there. So it's just that it's kind of a, a fun, a fun collection that I've I've enjoyed working with. So I want to share it um, as much as I can. <coughs> okay, and then kind of getting closer to the visual podcast series part. This is, we have a YouTube channel. The photo archives has its own kind of channel. The museum has a channel, and Casa San Isidro, which is sort of our, our other property in Corrales, they have a channel as well. And so we're all trying to create programming to share online, especially during the pandemic, but we are trying to continue this. So the Photo Archives YouTube channel is pretty much at this point dedicated to picture this. Um, it was at the start, it does have some of the radio programs on there before we got an upgrade to the e-museum so that we, we could load them in through that platform, um, but I'm not, adding radio programs to this YouTube channel anymore. Um, so this is really just dedicated for picture risk. So now we'll talk a little bit about the, the picture this. Um, so I guess I should give a little warning here. Um, there are some sounds that are gonna be coming through because I do use sound effects. I have put some sound clips into this um, presentation, and there's a beginning tone and an end tone that I use at the beginning and the end of every series. And when we were testing this earlier, they're probably going to all play at the same time, but if you just hang with us, I'll, I'll explain, um, and then hopefully we'll play it at, at the appropriate moment and you'll be able to hear it all <laughs> uh, as, as hopefully um, intended. So, uh, but these are, um, Examples of some of the photographs that are used within the Picture This uh, series. There are right now 26 episodes of the series on the YouTube channel. Um, so what you've got here at the top up here, this is uh, the Dawson Mine uh, story. Many of the stories are Albuquerque focused, but there are some that are outside of Albuquerque. The Dawson Mine disasters is an example of, of, the, of outside of Albuquerque. The image that is unfortunately kind of skewed over there, that, that is um, the laundry strike of 1919. It's an amazing, amazing story of a very early union uh, in Albuquerque that was successful at, at gaining uh, workers' rights. And then the five that you see below, these are uh, people that are sort of featured 
in um, in the podcast in different ways. Sometimes they are sort of the main character because I do some biographical um, episodes. Sometimes they're sort of um, part of a cast of characters. So uh, you've got Elsie Westerfield here. She's a motorette. There's a, an episode on the motorette. You have Isleta Pueblo Governor Pablo Aveda. Um, the King of Belgium came to Isleta, and so he features very prominently in that episode. In the middle there, you have Alabama Milner. Alabama Milner is a photographer. Um, in the collection, we have a, a, probably over 600 of her photographs. So there's one entirely uh, based on her. Fourth over, you have Owen Smalding. Mm -hmm. Owen Smalding was, is an incredible athlete who came out of Albuquerque High School. He had just an amazing career in baseball all around the country. Um, and then at the very end there, you have someone who I didn't know that we knew who, who he was, but that, that is Suhu Ampong. And he uh, is featured in the, um, actually in the same, the same uh, laundry strike episode as, as, the, as this beautiful one. Okay. We'll hear those again. Um, <laughs> So currently there are 26 episodes of the podcast that are available on that YouTube channel. And it covers everything from um, balloons. So Park Van Tassel, he was the first um, episode that went that, that I that I created to try to use as sort of a it was just sort of a, a, a trial run to see if my, my bosses would let me continue. And so that, that's episode one. Uh, music, BB uh, King and Placidas. Um, activism, as I said, there's um, the union uh, story, transportation, the motorettes. Um, we've got World War One. We've got we've got health. Um, there's uh, industry, sports, food. Um, if, you want to, if you're curious about how we got a steak cookie, there's an episode on that. Um, and bi biographies as well. I've gotten kind of more into doing um, stories of one particular person because those are really it's not something that I feel like I'm probably going to be able to do in-house. So one reason that these that these episodes even got started is because I, I do have a huge collection. There's 150,000, which is much, much bigger than either the art or the history collection combined here. But I need to have 25 to about 40 photographs in order to be able to create an exhibit in-house that will go up on the walls out here. Most of those 150,000 items fall into collections of 10 photos or less. And so the only way that I can really share those, I thought, in a meaningful way and get those stories out there was to create this, this series, which allows me to sometimes use only one or two photographs, but make sure that I have a way of sharing that story. And because they live on YouTube, they're, they're evergreen, essentially, so they last longer than than my exhibits do in the hallway as well. So, so there's a there's um, a few reasons why why I went this route. Um, I did try I did try to stick to seven to eight minutes in length. I initially thought Caloris is a good time period. I thought theirs is about seven to eight minutes. The way PBS has their Caloris segments, and I thought, oh, okay. Um, unfortunately, I'm heading more toward the 10, 12 minute mark, <laughs> so I'm trying to bring it back down. Um, but but I. My target is usually to not, not go really, really long on these. Mm -hmm. um, oh, so, but I do try to sort of, I guess, brand the, the episodes a little bit. They all have the, the same uh, title component, the same title screen. And then there's an opening tune and a closing tune. That's the same no matter what I'm talking about. So let's see if we can play the opening tune. So that's that's the opening tune, and then I usually um, do a little intro, and and then uh, at the very end, then we play the closing tune. And so for me, that helps me to tie all the episodes together and sort of use it as um, this is sort of a, a bit of a branding uh, mark. Okay, let's try. Um, so 
to talk now about kind of how I do this, uh, and then we'll sort of move move forward to how I hope that maybe maybe you could do this too. Um, when I'm choosing what stories to tell, I honestly just look through the collection. I find something that's pure that I'm curious about, and I dig deeply, and then I decide, like, hey, I'm going to talk about it then. Because my feeling is, <clears throat> if I'm interested in it, someone else might be interested too. And that's kind of that's kind of the impetus for a lot of these. Um, so I do go looking for the photographs first, and I come up with the narrative. I want my curiosity to be peaked before. I don't want to be bored trying to write the story. Um, so this one is the, the newest episode. It's called Tinseltown at the Depot. This is a collection of um, photographs that were taken of celebrities in the 1920s at the train depot at Alvarado Hotel. This was taken by a man named William Steele Dean. Um, and so we had the photographs and many of them were um, identified. So you've got Mary Pickford here. You've got our gang, Little Rascal. Mm -hmm. And at the end there, you've got Rudolph Valentino. And that's his dog uh, named Centaur Pin Dragon that he would exercise up and down the train platform. And so William Steele Dean, um, I didn't really know much about him. And so although I could tell the story of, of the train coming and stopping in Albuquerque uh, between Los Angeles and Chicago and kind of you know, how long they would be here, how long, how many people would get off the train and kind of exercise uh, or walk up and down, meet people. Um, I needed to find out about William Steele Dean in order to actually tell this story. So um, what I do is I just start digging. Like I'm a librarian, I'm an archivist. This is basically what I what I love to do and what I what I was taught how to do. So um, newspaper archive, many of these things, these are all free. The, the, the resources that I'm going to tell you for the most part are all free. Um, but the newspaper archive database here where you can search newspaper articles, that one, and then Heritage Quest, which is where I go and look at the census records, war records. Um, those are free with your public library card. So um, they have a really amazing collection of database and, and resources that you can you can access through your library card with Albuquerque Public Library. So I, I really take a lot of advantage of that. So uh, in trying to figure out who William Steele Dean was, I searched the census records. I lucked out on the 1950 census, which was just made public this year. Um, and because William Steele Dean landed on one of the lines where they asked him extra questions. So we got extra information. Um, so I did learn that he did not complete uh, schooling past the seventh grade, which confirmed something that I had read in this article, which was that he was, he came to Albuquerque because he had tuberculosis um, as a child, and he was so sick that, that he really didn't, um, couldn't really attend school. He had difficulty holding down jobs later in life just, just because his health didn't really allow it. However, he did, um, he was hired, he loved music, he met if you, if you think about what um, Albuquerque was like in the 1910s um, and, and maybe early 1920s with all of the tuberculosis patients that were coming here, it was a very interesting community. And it was full of people from all different backgrounds that were coming. And he was meeting these people and he seemed to um, gravitate toward musicians. He liked music and he was good at it. And he wound up uh, befriending musicians who would go on to found the Hollywood Bowl Orchestra and, and, and write music for some of the silent films. And what he ended up doing, he, he stayed in Albuquerque his whole life, as far as I can tell. And um, he became the organ player at Chemo Theater right when it first opened. He was playing the music for the silent films. And then what he would do is he would see the films and he got very into film and very into Hollywood. And he had a little autograph book and he, he, he could walk down to Alvarado Hotel and he would wait there on the platform, he would meet the train and he would get the autographs of these stars and these celebrities. And so within that collection, there's Mary Pickford's autograph in his, in his um, autograph book. But he saw like Albert Einstein, he saw William uh, Randolph Hearst um, and then a lot of the silent film stars, some of whom you know, some of whom I, I, I was really struggling to even find who they, what, 
like what they were in, or their, their names are really not, I, I couldn't really find much about them, but then there are, there are, there are the Mary Pickford's, there are the Rudolph Valentino's as well. So, um, so this is something that I would just sort of uh, encourage is, is even if you find a photo and you really like what you, what, what you see, when you dig into it, don't be afraid to just use all the resources that are out there to, to really pull that narrative together. Okay, so I'll start talking about um, some of the different episodes that, that are um, featured in this series. This is episode number three, so this is kind of an earlier one. Um, the Loveless Astronaut Program. Um, we have these two photographs, the one here and the one in the center. That's from the, I put the collection uh, numbers on the bottom um, sort of to help uh, showcase this a little bit because the William Steele Dean um, podcast was done entirely from one collection. But sometimes you have donors who are donating images that are um, related, but they don't even know that we have something else. And so you can pull from all these different collections to tell a much stronger story than you could if you only stick with one collection. So the one in the, the, the photo in the center and the photo here, those came from one donor. And then the photo on the end, that's Jerry Cobb. And that photo was really important to be able to tell the side of this of the astronaut program that dealt entirely with the with the women's side, which was not um, not really federally funded, which is the same as the men's side. And as you know, the um, the women did not become astronauts. Yeah, they didn't actually get to get to fly uh, in the shuttles the way that the men did. But being able to tell the story because they still came through Loveless Clinic. This stuff all happened here in Albuquerque. So you had we needed that photograph to really be able to to tell the other half of the story, which, which made it a much more um, compelling, I think, and full, like, well-rounded uh, podcast. So. Alan Shepard became the first American in space when he flew for 15 minutes before returning to Earth. John Glenn became the first American to orbit the Earth. All seven men would fly in space. Alan Shepard would also walk on the moon as commander of Apollo 14. None of these men could have reached these heights without making it through Dr. Lovelace's tests in Albuquerque. You'll hear that again in just a minute when we move forward. But uh, but this um, that was an example of the um, the ways that you can use sound effects to also help create atmosphere in your story. There's a lot of websites that are out there that offer um, sound effects, um, and that, that that that's not a what you heard is is not a NASA recording or anything of any not not official anything, but. There's a lot of creative people out there that make a lot of sounds <laughs> and they put them online and you can you can um, get a lot of them for free to use in your storytelling in, in these kinds of um, these kinds of uh, projects. So I wonder can, I wonder if we if we're gonna hear the whole thing again or if we can go forward in case. Alan Shepard, thank you. Oh, great. Okay. Um, so this this episode is on the uh, Albuquerque Dukes baseball team. This, um, this is an example of pulling from a lot of different collections that are in the photo archives. For one reason is how, how many decades this story covers um, in order to, to really try to pull images from, from the entire life of the team. You really have to search pretty deeply into the archive and start, start pulling images out. But the other thing, um, this was one of the first episodes where I started um, working with colleagues around the country to be able to tell this story wider. Um, and uh, so I wrote off to the Los Angeles Dodgers, to their archivist, and I, because I knew that the, the Albuquerque Dukes played, played the Dodgers and um, they won. <laughs> And, and I wanted to know, you know, what was that like? Did they have photos of it? Did they have a scorecard? Who played? What was, you know, what was that going on? And, and what was very interesting was 
The archive uh, in Los Angeles, they, the team's archive does have a record of that game. They do, they do have um, photos of that game, um, but the, the archivist himself was at the game. And so the archivist was able to tell me his personal story and how cool it was for him to get to be there and to see, to see this team play. It was, it was in 1981. Um, there was a strike that year, I believe, and so it had been um, it had been a while since since the teams had gotten to play in front of their fans. And also, um, LA, you know, they knew who these guys were because these these were the ones who were coming up and they were going to play for their team. So so this is this is the minor league team for for the professional team. So it was exciting. The fans were very excited. They were happy to see it, and having his perspective of actually. Being at that game also helped me to be able to tell the story um, more, like more accurately than I would have if I hadn't had that first person, um, <laughs> that first person experience. And that really just comes from reaching out and asking people, "Hey, do you have anything? Is there anything that you would let me use? Is there, you know, how do I tell this story, you know, better?" Um, uh, Jill, quick question. Like here, where it says 1996, is that the year that the city got that image? Exactly. So yeah, so what you're looking at is um, these catalog numbers, okay. uh, PA, it stands for photo archives, right? And then, and then yeah, the, the, the year is the year of donation. The middle year, I'll just tell you this, because this is, <laughs> uh, the middle year here, or the middle number is um, the number of collections that we've had that year. So, so that would be um, 20. Yeah, we got this is the 29th collection that the museum got in 1996, and this is the 517th item within the 29th collection that we got in 1996 for the photo archive. So that's how you that's how you read the catalog numbers. The game was televised nationally, and the announcer was Don Drysdale. The Dukes spent the pregame signing autographs for the legions of Los Angeles fans who were excited to see their veterans against the new up-and-comers from Albuquerque. It was the largest stage the Dukes had been on. They stood tall. The Albuquerque Dukes beat the Los Angeles Dodgers one to nothing. The Dodgers would recover from their loss and go on to win the World Series that season. So this is um, the, the scorecard that we got from the from the Los Angeles Dodgers, um, from the archivist that was there. And also these two photographs came from that from that archive. And I do, I'll just say, I do um, always credit the, the institutions that share with me. Okay. The game was televised nationally. So we've heard a couple of sound effects here. I do try to use those um, just to try to create atmosphere. So it's not just me always talking. Um, I, I do think that they help to set a mood. And so when, when you find something that you think might work, um, I, I, I encourage you to give it a try. There's a lot of free sound effects that are available. Um, and sometimes if you just start listening, you'll start to hear um, if they're gonna fit. Because even if like, like on the Dawson Mine, um, Podcast. I didn't have any. Nobody was like in minds uh, taking, you know, sound effects or anything. But you can you can take what they've got. Like somebody throwing a rock down a well sounds a lot like the mind caving in on mine. If you if you're in that mindset already and you're hearing the story, the sounds will will work with your imagination to really complete that that storytelling mood and that atmosphere. So Owen Smalding, um, I talked a little bit about him uh, earlier. He is one of, um, I think, one of the one of my favorite podcast um, episodes that I created, and it was a very deep dive into one person. He is the star of the podcast, and he. We only have these two photographs to tell his story, and his story actually starts in Texas. It comes here for a long period of time, and then it moves all around the country. It goes to to uh, Washington State, Idaho, Chicago, all the way down into, into um, the deep south, back to Chicago. He's all over the place. But um, his, his impact on Albuquerque is that he, he is probably still considered, I think, 
probably the best all around athlete to ever come out of Albuquerque High School. And when you, when you look at what he, what he accomplished at a very young age um, in high school, he just, he ran away with, with records, one right after the other. And it was um, during World War I that he was in high school here. He did get drafted. He had to go and do service. He came back. He re-enrolled as a senior at, at Albuquerque High School. He was the captain of the track team. Um, and the state athletic board disqualified him from, um, from running in his very last senior uh, state championship prep meet because they said because he late enrolled, he enrolled late because of his service, he was not allowed to, to participate. The entire Albuquerque High School track team removed themselves from that meet. So really, it's a really important, I think, moment um, for, for us to, to know that that happened um, and that, that people rallied around him. And he went on to have an incredible career. He went to college. Um, he played baseball uh, and football um, for University of Washington. And then he ended up at University of Idaho and he got a business degree. After that, he went and he played for the Negro Leagues. He played alongside Satchel Paige. And he, um, he just has this, this amazing story. And I don't want to like tell you the whole thing, but, but basically, yeah. But, but what's cool is that um, the, the, he has a, there's a gymnasium called Smalding, the Smalding Gymnasium down um, in, uh, in the South Broadway area, which is where he grew up. And um, one of my colleagues, I, made, I did this episode, one of my colleagues saw it she um, had, had been working here. She went and she was, she now teaches at Albuquerque High School. And her husband is the athletic director. He saw it. They started talking. And now, um, now there's a, a scholarship named for Owen Smalling at Albuquerque High School. And so it's, it's, I say that not only because I'm really proud of it, but also because um, when you create these, you don't know the impact that your storytelling might have out in the community. So it's important, I think, to share life and whatever knowledge and whatever stories that you have to tell. They, I mean, they have a life of their own outside of outside of you and outside of what you create. And so, um, anyway, that's that's Owen. So, thanks. <laughs> oh, and this is yeah. This is also the so this is still still Owen um, because. In order to tell Owen's story, I really had to dig really deeply into a lot of archives, more than I had ever done previously. And so the Special Collections Library, there's some of my favorite people on earth over there. And, so, and they helped me get the yearbooks, they helped me, um, they helped me with the podcast, they helped me find tidbits of information, confirm things. Um, the Chicago Historical Society, the Library of Congress is, a, is one you should always check. Um, there, these are uh, and then the, the Baseball Hall of Fame is great. Um, and so I, I would just, just suggest trying to, to locate the right image. If you think that there's a right image and you don't have it, but you think it might be out there, I would suggest really exploring it and making sure that you, that you try because you don't really know what you're going to find unless you ask and unless you go digging. Um, in some of these Library of Congress and National Archives are very... Uh, very easy ones for you to get because they are yours. Um, they're free. You, sh you should use them all the time. <laughs> um, the Library of Congress is nice because you can sometimes download high resolution images as well from there. But those are those are public uh, collections, so definitely definitely use those. In 1919, Albuquerque High School's track team withdrew from the state meet over a question of Smalling's eligibility. Because of his military service, his schooling was disrupted and he was delayed in re-enrolling for the school year. The state's athletic board decided that that delayed enrollment was enough to make Owen Smalling ineligible to compete in the finals of his senior year track meet. And Albuquerque High School's entire team withdrew from the competition, leaving a bitter end to Smalling's high school track career. His preliminary races that year showed that he was likely to have set a few more state records in 1919 had they allowed him to compete. But the experience did little to dampen the new high school graduate's love of sports as he moved up to college level athletics, first at the University of Washington and finishing his business degree through an athletic scholarship at the University of Idaho. Okay, <laughs> it's, it's just, I, I, um, it's something that I, I 
dug really deeply into the story and got so caught up in, in his life and the legacy that that I think he he left. And, and I think it's this this got me more into wanting to do more biographical um, picture the text. So so I have found myself doing more, more of those. So William Steele Dean kind of came because Owen came first. So. In 1919, Albuquerque High School's track team withdrew. Okay. Okay. Um, but this is another one, Alabama Milner. Um, this is a collection. Uh, she, she was also on that, that page um, that had all the, the portraits on the bottom. Alabama Milner is a photographer and most of her collection, maybe not all, but a, a big chunk of it is here at the Albuquerque Museum Photo Archives. And so this one, I had hundreds and hundreds of photographs to pull from. But I only I, I could use it all from this one archive. So um, this is she's another just she's one of my favorite photographers that we have in the collection. And so being able to tell her story is also kind of a, a, it's a joy. Um, and that's honestly that's that's why I do the these podcast series is because I enjoy it. And so um, I try to try to just show things that I find interesting and hope that others will. And so she um, was born in Alabama um, and Alabama is her, is her family, but she uh, came to Albuquerque um, when she was in her thirties, but she had been actually formally trained as a photographer, which is very rare, um, pretty rare at that time, around the, around the turn of the, of the 20th century, right around 1900. She, enrolled at the Southern School of Photography, which was really the best um, photography school that you could get to. It was co-ed. Um, she was taught by men and women. She was taught how to set up her studio. That's her studio um, in the middle here. Um, and as you can see, she, she's a good photographer. <laughs> like she, she leading lines, she, can, she knows how to do finishing on the negatives. These are glass plate negatives. Um, and so, so it's, it's a pleasure to be able to show some of the, the really good photographs that we hold in the collection from photographers that were local as well. Alabama, now in her early 40s, was the sole proprietor of her own studio, fulfilling the dream that she had held growing up outside of Birmingham. But this was just the beginning. Her realized ambitions would soon blossom into a successful business venture that would span the next 30 years. Um, this, this particular podcast also was done in conjunction with a photo archives exhibit that was in the hallway that was called We Lead Others Follow. That was focused on five um, women photographers who owned completely um, on their own or in equal partnership photography studios in town before the passage of, of before suffrage, before they had the right to vote. Um, and so Alabama Milner is is one of those five women. So this podcast did in some ways um, support that exhibit, but it still lives on on, on the YouTube page. Alabama now. Oops. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how to, can you go back? Okay, yes. great. Um, just so now we're going to talk, get into the part where I can um, let you know how to create your own. Um, so, Locate images, do your own research, um, write a script. Um, I do use try to use the same signature opener and, and closing text, as well as that opening and closing tune. Um, you have sound booth, that's incredible. Definitely use that. This is an example of how I soundproof my office. <laughs> um, and, I'll, and I have these blankets that are just sort of in my storage, collection storage. I just cover cover my desk, I close my door, I put my phone on do not disturb, and I talk basically into the blanket. <laughs> uh, I have a smartphone app that I use. Um, I use Spreaker. Spreaker is a free um, smartphone app. It basically just acts as a microphone, but it is attached to an online um, podcasting website. So if you did just want to record and publish straight through there. You could you would get a link. You could just hand out to people, and they could go there and listen to your podcast series. Um, I uh, record the audio, and I don't make them public on that website because I need to download the audio and import it into what I use is uh, Wondershare Filmora, um, so that I can have the audio 
and add the images, the sound effect, all of that. Oh, the speaker does have a does have some sound effects with it, by the way. So, so you can you can actually incorporate sound effects right through their uh, interface. Um, and then I publish once I'm done with the Filmora um, aspect, and I just publish to YouTube. Share the link, and you know you're you're kind of you're rolling at that point. You can you can kind of um, see. On, on YouTube, you can see uh, analytics, so you can kind of get a chance to see if people are looking at it, how long they're looking at it, are they are they leaving, you know, are they are they only listening for like five seconds and then they leave, are they wa watching the whole thing? Um, you can get a lot of data from from those sites to help you um, build a stronger podcast. This is the list of episodes that's currently online for Picture This. When I started this, I started this in um, January of 2020, and it was something that I wanted to do uh, before I before I took the job to be the digital archivist. I was a children's librarian for the public library in the South Valley. My favorite thing to do down there was to do uh, preschool and family story time. When I got here, I enjoyed my job, but I missed story time, <laughs> and so this this is essentially my my attempt to still do story time um, in my current job. It, it allows me creativity, it allows um, digging in, doing research, and then just presenting stories. So, but I thought that I would just do four a year. And then um, the pandemic hit, and everyone was like, we need stuff to put online. And so we're up to 26 now, and I, we're just kind of keep going um, as inspiration and time allow. Um, at the bottom, a uh, very long link, uh, that is where the city has put the links for this podcast. Um, if, you, if you really want to see them, I would really suggest going to YouTube, typing in Albuquerque Museum Photo Archives, <laughs> and then getting to it from there. Uh, but they are on the city's website as well. Uh, so thank you for listening. And, and again, um, I'll put this back up. If you have questions, um, I'm happy to answer, and I'm also uh, ready to uh, show show you the photo archives if you're if you're curious if you want to um, see any of that. Please let me know. Thank you. Thank you. Are you ever able to uh, edit something later when you discover some new piece of? Very relevant. I can't, and I, I think I've done that once. Only one time have I gone back where I thought, oh, that's that's so important. And it was actually that I found a photograph that uh, I had talked about. Um, it had to do with there's a there's a story about an um, an aviatrix named uh, Laura Ingalls, and she she crashed her plane here, and I only had one picture of of her, um, but I found a second, and I found a picture of the actual plane. And it was really important because there was there was a, a slogan written on the tail of the plane that I had mentioned in the podcast, but had no visual um, evidence for. And so that that photograph allowed for the visual evidence. And it, it was she was um, not to be like a spoiler, but she wound up uh, being put in prison because she had been uh, paid by the by the SS by the Nazis to to do propaganda in the U.S. And she only crashed in one. One time, and she crashed here. She wasn't from here. She crashed here, and and all of these pamphlets and all of these propaganda things flew all over the the East Mesa. The picture that we have is her trying to get these things with her little plane. Um, but but I found a second photograph that had this. She was against the expeditionary forces. Um, uh, said no AEF was on the back of her plane, so we found that. So I did go back and add that. So yeah, it's rare, but I do it. Yeah. Anthony Gomez, um, I was going to ask you, uh, is there any plans like doing a, a podcast on um, William Cobb's son, the actor? Uh, this guy was in over 700 films. Yes, and I have so many pictures of him because the Cobb family took so many pictures of themselves. Um, <laughs> but I think, yes, uh, ideally, yes, he would be an amazing person because we do even have pictures of him um, in like theatrical um, 
uh, yeah, yeah, and like plays and stuff here that he did here. Um, and and it's, it's an important story too because it ties in to, to the rest of the family. His, his sister went to go visit him in Hollywood and she died on the train coming back. There's a lot of, the family is wound up, is, is all, you know, um, all together. So yes, yeah. uh, if I can find out how to do it in less than like 15 minutes, I'm going <laughs> to do it. <laughs> Absolutely. I was, um, I was cleaning out the cop um, burial site at the historic Christian cemetery. I decided to do some research on the family. I was just amazed at, at his uh, profession. Yes, yeah, that, that whole family. Um, mm -hmm. Eddie Cobb was also one of the women featured in the We Lead Others Follow, the five women photographers and her, their, their whole story is just incredible. So yes, definitely Edmund's on the list. I'll throw out another suggestion that during the during the lockdown, I looked into the, to see if there were any recordings or any history on Dick Bills and the Sandia Mountain Boys. Oh, oh when, wow! When Glenn Campbell was was playing for them, and I know that they were they were on the KLB TV, I think, occasionally. But I don't know if there'd be anything in the archive. I think we have one photograph of them together. Yeah, so yeah, definitely. Very little, or nothing out there. Yeah, that's yeah, yeah. I'm always open to suggestions. Please send me send me your ideas or do them yourself. Also, it's like a great thing. This is so great. Yes. You keep mentioning the wall that you put up. Is that the wall out here? That how uh, yeah. often do you change? So, so the, the the wall is um, when we go out here. You'll see the photo archive has kind of three walls that go around a little corner. That's the wall that the photo archive shows are on. They change approximately. Um, I'd say like every 10 months or so, we're supposed, I'm supposed to put a new one up. So this one that's out here right now is, um, it's on, it's called We Built This City. It's on the construction of Albuquerque. Um, there is a podcast attached to it um, that's all about the new deal in Albuquerque. And for the first time, you know, I'm learning as I go here, but uh, I did put a QR code on the text panel in the exhibit. So when people, Take a shot of that. They go straight to the to the podcast um, episode that that relates. So I'm still trying to figure out how to incorporate them. You know how to incorporate the podcast into you know the actual in-house part. Um, but the, this show will come down October 30th. There's a new show that will go up. It's called These Unfamiliar Faces, and so it's it's um, it's the Brooks collection. It's which is a portrait collection. Um, and it will go up uh, November 4th, I believe. So, yeah. Okay. Well, for no more questions, we'll yeah. conclude this part. And those that are interested, follow well, Jill to her office and she'll show you some more things. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not sure.